Hi all. Today we are going to discuss about some special quantity called momentum. You can see in the picture some situations where momentum is very important like explosions, collisions. The person whom you see in the picture is Isaac Newton. He was the one introduced the word momentum to the world. Let's see what are the objectives, the outcomes of this topic. You are going to see Newton's second law, impulse, conservation of momentum in one dimension and two dimension, elastic inelastic collisions and the relation between kinetic energy and momentum. What's the meaning of momentum? Momentum is actually a very simple quantity. It's a product of mass and velocity. You know what's mass, you know what's velocity. When you combine, you get a new quantity called momentum. The unit of momentum, one unit you can get directly from the equation. That's mass is kilogram and velocity is meter per second. So you get kilogram meter per second. It has an alternative unit, Newton second also, which we will come across later. One of the important property of momentum, sometimes confusing, is it's a vector quantity. The problem with vector quantities is they have direction. So if you have taken one momentum as positive, then the opposite momentum you have to take negative. This is sometimes confusing in calculations. For example, you can see the car which is going towards the right, if I have taken a positive momentum, then the one who is going to the left, I should take negative momentum. You have to follow this rule throughout all the calculations. See why Newton introduced the word momentum or to explain which phenomenon he was using the word momentum. You can consider a ball, it's not moving. Let's take the velocity, initial velocity is zero. Now I'm applying a force on the ball. So you can see what happens. The velocity or the momentum of the ball has changed. So from zero, the velocity has changed. Means the momentum of the ball also changed. Now I'm applying a bigger force. So what you can observe is the change in momentum is also greater. Before the change was from 0 to 10, now the change is from 0 to 20. So Newton explained force or resultant force is something that changes the momentum of a body. And if you want to produce a bigger change, you need to apply a bigger force. So the resultant force acting on a body is directly proportional to the change in momentum. Now let's see, is there any other factor that decides the resultant force. Same example I am taking again. A ball is not moving. Initial velocity is zero. Now I am applying a force so that the velocity is changed to 20 in a time of 3 seconds. Just an example. Now what I want to do is I want to make the velocity 20 again but this time I want to do it faster like in one second. So what should I do? If you want to change the momentum in a shorter time, you have to apply a bigger force. So if you apply a bigger force, the momentum changes in a shorter time. So the second factor that decides the resultant force acting on a body is the time. Or the resultant force acting on a body is inversely proportional to the time. Shorter time, bigger force. Now I am combining these two factors into a single equation like this. So together you can say the resultant force acting on a body is equal to change in momentum over time or that's what you call the rate of change of momentum. So what you can see there is the statement of Newton's second law. The rate of change of momentum is equal to the resultant force acting on a body. Mathematically you can write this is an equation, final momentum minus initial momentum divided by time. That's what you call force. This is what you call the Newton's second law. For convenience, we simplify it as F equal to MA 
where is the acceleration that's coming from v minus u over t so i'm taking m as common and v minus u over t will give acceleration this is the idea of newton's second law do some calculations using newton's second law how to use this equation in a real life situation so let's consider a ball is hitting a racket and bouncing back for the simple case i have taken the forward and backward velocities to be same so initial and final velocity both are 10 meter per second and the collision lasts for like say 0 0.2 seconds so how much force did the racket give on the ball that's a question so let's use the equation directly the newton second law i am putting the values over there 0 0.1 is the mass initial velocity also 10 final velocity also 10 time is 0 0.2 but there's a big mistake in the substitution if you do directly this calculation you will get the answer 0 but you know the force is not 0 so the problem here is I have not taken one direction as negative so if you have taken the forward velocity as plus 10 the reverse velocity should be taken as minus 10 the reverse velocity should be minus 10 then you will get the answer 10 newton so this is the force acting on the ball from the racket now the racket also will get a force from the ball so let's see how much force will be acting on the racket this can be easily found using newton's third law because when the ball exerts a force on the racket at the same time the same moment the racket also will exert an equal and opposite force on the ball these two forces we can call the third law pairs and the third law pairs are always equal and opposite so the force on the racket is 10 newton but in the opposite direction so i'm using minus 10 so the negative stands for opposite direction let's discuss about a very related quantity that's impulse we will start from newton's second law change in momentum over time is resultant force what i'm doing is a simple cross multiplication i am bringing the time to the left hand side so when you cross multiply the quantity what you get f into t that's called impulse so the impulse is practically same as change in momentum and impulse and momentum will have exactly same units because it's just the change in momentum okay some examples where impulse is very important in our everyday life so let's see how can you explain the situation using newton's second law or impulse the final velocity or the final momentum of both x are zero because both of them are coming to rest so what you can say is the change in momentum means the momentum just before collision and momentum immediately after collision are exactly same for both x both are coming to rest the only difference between the x is one of the x takes longer time the one falling on the pillow will take a longer time to get stopped so if you are using the equation newton's second law change in momentum over time the numerator is same for both x because their final velocities are same their initial velocities are also same and their masses of course i have taken identical x so the masses are also same the only difference between them is the time for which the force is acting on the pillow the force is acting for longer time but on the concrete surface the force is acting for less time so as you can see as the time is less the force should increase because change in momentum remains same the concrete surface will exert a greater force on the x than the pillow okay another example you might have seen in the game of cricket when the players take a catch they move their hand backwards 
to take the catch. So, what's the use? What's the advantage of moving the hand backwards? Exactly same thing just now we have seen. As you increase the time of interaction, as you increase the time for which the force is acting, you can reduce the amount of force. From Newton's second law, if the time increases, force will decrease. So they are allowing more time for the ball to stop. They are allowing more time for the ball to become zero velocity. This is how you can reduce the force acting on your hand. The use of airbags. So what actually an airbag do is, it will allow more time for your head to stop. If there's no airbag, your head will be stopped suddenly. So the force acting on your head will be very big. But if you allow more time for your head to stop, the force will decrease. The numerator, the change in momentum will remain same. Whether you have an airbag or if you don't have an airbag, your head will ultimately get stopped. But the difference with the airbag is it will allow more time for your head to stop. As a result, the force acting on your head will be less according to Newton's second law or according to the equation for impulse. Okay. So this is the very basic idea about momentum. Now we are going to the next part which is why momentum is so special. What's the speciality momentum has which is not there for most of the other quantities you have studied or you are going to study. So let's see that. Momentum is so special because of its conservation. Momentum is always conserved. What's the meaning of conserved? So let's see an example. What's the meaning of momentum is always conserved? Let's see what's the meaning of saying momentum is always conserved. Or let's see what you mean by law of conservation of momentum. You can see two masses m1 and m2. They are moving with velocities u1 and u2 and they collide. After collision, they have different velocities. M1 was moving with a speed v1 and M2 is moving with a speed v2. After the collision, you can see in the picture. Now the law of conservation of momentum says the total momentum before. This is the momentum of M1 and M2 before. Mass into their velocity. And this is the total momentum after. Again mass into the new velocity. The law of conservation of momentum says the total momentum of the system, system means both bodies together, should be equal to the total momentum after. This is what law of conservation of momentum says. The total momentum of both objects before should be equal to the total momentum of objects after. But there is a condition. Let's see what's the exact statement of law of conservation of momentum. This is very very important for the exams. The statement they will ask to write as it is. The statement goes total momentum of a system. So system can be anything. You can consider just the two balls as a system or even you can consider the whole universe as a single system. Okay, it's depending on the question you can treat the system. The momentum will be conserved only if there's no external force acting on it. External force. For example, if you think about the previous example, any force between the two balls is not a problem. That's not external. That is within the system. So any force within the system is okay but there should not be any force from outside external that's like for example if there's a friction in the previous example if the balls are moving above a rough surface then momentum will not get conserved so there should not be any external force like friction or things like that any force inside the system like between two balls there's a force when they collide 
but that force is not a problem. With that force, momentum will be conserved. The same statement you can even write as the total momentum of an isolated system. Isolated just means the same thing, no external force acting. That's called isolated system. Or even you can say the momentum lost or change in momentum of one body will be equal to the momentum gained by the other body. So these are all statements of law of conservation of momentum. Let's see how these can be applied in everyday situations. Before that, let's see mathematically how we can represent the law of conservation of momentum. Sigma here represents the total. So it can be written as total momentum before equal to total momentum after. Or a more convenient way of using it. Momentum of first body plus momentum of second body before a collision should be equal to momentum of first body plus second body after the collision. This is what conservation of momentum says. Or when you rearrange, even you can prove that change in momentum of first body should be equal to the change in momentum of the second body. Let's see more examples or more scenarios where you can use the conservation of momentum. So in this example, one body was moving initially and the other one was not moving. And after collision, they stick together and they join together and they move with a common velocity V. So let's see how you can use the conservation of momentum here. Before, only one body was moving. So the red sphere momentum is zero. And after, both are moving together with a common velocity V. This is how you can write the equation for conservation of momentum in this particular example. Like this, you can rewrite the conservation of momentum equation for that particular situation. So let's do a simple calculation here. Let's say they have given mass of the blue sphere and red one, the initial velocities. The question is to find the final velocity. So you know m1, m2, you know u, you want to find v. So I'm using the equation above, what you see above, m1 into u. m1 into u is the momentum of first body plus zero. I'm not putting zero. After collision, both are moving together. So I have taken the mass as 12 because m1 and m2 are moving together with a common velocity v. This is how you substitute in the law of conservation of momentum equation. Then you will get velocity 16.6 .6 meter per second. Now let's see another example. This time the masses are coming from opposite and colliding. Okay, so the question is, what will be the velocities of each body after collision? Before the velocities are given, the masses also given, what will be the velocities of the bodies after collision? Always in such situations, we have to use the law of conservation of momentum. So I'm using total before. This is the momentum of the blue sphere and this is the momentum of the red one. You can see I have taken minus 25. Why I have taken minus 25? Because the red one is moving opposite to blue. So you could take either one as minus, but I preferred red to be as minus or negative velocity. Okay. Now, after collision, we are going to find. We don't know. We don't know. M1, V1 also we don't know. V2 also we don't know. So let's calculate the left hand side first. 10 into 5 is 50 plus 2 into 25 also 50 but there's a minus. So it's 50 minus 50 you get 0. Before collision the total momentum of the system is 0. Means according to the law of conservation of momentum after collision also the momentum should be 0. That means both bodies will not move. So after the collision, both will be stopped immediately because their momentum will cancel each other. Okay? Let's see a different example now. 
explosion. You can see a 10 kg mass there. This 10 kg mass is exploding into two smaller parts, an 8 kg and a 2 kg mass. So as you can see in, from the diagram, 2 kg mass is going faster. So it's obvious it's a smaller mass, so it should go faster. Now you are asked to prove that. Why 2 kg mass should go faster? Using the concept of physics, you have to prove it. Again, since it's an explosion, I'm using the conservation of momentum. The total momentum before explosion is zero because the 10 kg, original 10 kg mass was not moving. That should be equal to total momentum after. Let's take M1V1 and M2V2. We don't know. But what you can see from the diagram is the two masses are going opposite. So if you have taken first velocity v1 let's say as positive then v2 should be taken as negative. That's the fundamental rule for momentum or velocity. I am changing that plus to a minus because one of the velocity I have to take minus. So v2 I am choosing to take as negative. Now I am rearranging the equation so I will get m1 v1 is equal to m2 v2. So I'm bringing m2 v2 to the left hand side, you get this equation. This equation you can use always in any explosions where before the body is not moving and it just explodes to different parts which move. So this is the equation, law of conservation of momentum in explosions, okay? Higher mass, the bigger mass should be having lower velocity because their momentum should be equal. So if the mass is more, velocity should be smaller to conserve the momentum. So let's do one calculation in explosions. The same example I'm taking, the 10 kg mass splitting into 8 kg and 2 kg. So you have to calculate the ratio. The velocity of 2 kg mass divided by velocity of 8 kg is how much? Means how much faster the 2 kg mass is going compared to 8 kg. I'm directly using this equation because I have modified the law of conservation of momentum like this to apply for explosions. Now cross multiply, bring all the velocities together and bring all the masses together on the right hand side. So I'm bringing V2 to the left hand side, I will get V1 over V2 should be equal to, I'm bringing M1 to the right hand side, I'll get M2 over M1. Be very careful here, should be M2 over M1, not M1 over M2. I'm substituting the values of M2 and M1, okay? Since the question says velocity of 2 kg on the numerator, I have taken V1 for 2 kg mass and V2 for 8 kg mass so that I will get V1 by V2 directly. So M2 means 8 kg because it's the mass for the velocity V2 and M1 is 2 kg. When you find the ratio, you'll get 4 as the answer. Means the 2 kg mass is moving 4 times faster than the 8 kg. More examples for conservation of momentum. Let's say you are pushing a person on ice. So let's see what happens. Both of you will move. So when you push a person, why you go backwards yourself? This is the question. You could easily explain this using Newton's third law. But here we are trying to explain this using law of conservation of momentum. In fact, Newton's third law is exactly same as law of conservation of momentum. So the total momentum before means both were not moving, means the system's momentum is zero, means the final momentum also should be zero. In this example, there won't be any external force because it's they are standing on frictionless ice. Initial momentum is zero, since no external force, the final momentum also should be zero. So if one person has a positive value for momentum, the other one should have a negative value of momentum. 
For this, they have to move opposite for one momentum to be positive and other momentum to be negative so that when you take the total momentum, you get zero again. Always in explosions, the objects will move opposite so that their momenta will cancel and you get zero momentum just like momentum before collision or explosion, okay? Let's see another very similar example that's motion of a rocket. Before the rocket moves, the fuel is inside the rocket and they are not moving, rocket and the fuel. So they have a momentum zero. After what happens is the fuel is ejected downwards, means the fuel has a downward momentum. So the rocket should have an upward momentum so that when you add the total momentum, you will get zero. So when the fuel goes downward, the rocket will move upwards. Let's see some more examples from everyday life. That's a recoil of a gun. When you fire a gun, the gun will move backwards. This is called recoil. Why this happens? Before you fire the gun, the gun and the bullet were not moving and they have a total momentum zero. So after you fire the gun also total momentum should be zero according to the law of conservation of momentum. So when the bullet goes forward, the gun should move backward with the same momentum so that when you add the total momentum of bullet plus gun, you will get zero. All the examples what we have seen until this, the objects involved were moving in a single straight line so that you could directly add momentum of one body plus momentum of other body easily but in real life you know the objects will not be moving in a single straight line before collision also they may, they may be moving at some angles even after collision also now we are going to see how to deal with collisions if they are not in one dimension The two bodies are moving in the same line before but after they are going at different angles. In such situations you cannot directly add the momentum because the velocities are in different directions and they are vectors. So let's see how to deal with these type of collisions. What we are going to do is we are going to apply the conservation of momentum separately for each direction. In each direction, the momentum should be conserved. For the simple case, I am taking horizontal and vertical directions. Means the total momentum in the horizontal direction before collision should be equal to total momentum in the horizontal direction after collision. Exactly same rule applies for all the directions. Vertically also, total momentum before should be equal to total momentum after. In each direction, the momentum should be conserved separately. So let's see how to do this mathematically. The problem here is after collision, the velocities are not in the same line. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split. I'm going to resolve the velocities which are not in the same line. So you can see the velocities here. What I'm going to do is each velocity v1 and v2 I'm going to resolve into horizontal and vertical parts. Let's split or resolve v1. You will get a horizontal part which I can call v1 cos theta1. It's a cos component because it's touching the angle theta1. The component which is not touching the angle is sine component and this becomes v1 sine theta1. So the v1 I have split it into a cos component and a sine component so v1 is gone. In the same way you can even split v2 into a horizontal part which will be v2 cos theta2 cos because it's touching the angle theta2 then a sine component v2 sine theta2. So the original velocities v1 and v2 are gone now we have these components two horizontally two vertically. Now let's see how to apply the law of conservation of momentum in the situation. I am applying first 
in the x direction the total momentum before should be equal to total momentum after in the x direction before collision both bodies were moving in the same line so you could directly add m1 u1 plus m2 u2 but after collision only the horizontal component of these velocities are in the horizontal direction so you cannot take the entire velocity v1 you have to consider only the component so i'm adding the horizontal momentum of each body after collision remember you cannot add the velocities you have to add the momenta because momentum only conserved velocity won't be conserved before and after only the total momentum of the system will be conserved now in the same way vertical direction i am going to use the rule total before collision is equal to total after collision but in the vertical direction what you can see is nothing is moving vertically before collision so the total momentum in the vertical direction before is zero because both are moving horizontally they won't have any component or any influence in the vertical direction but after collision you can see there are two parts each momentum has a vertical part so the total momentum after collision will be the vertical momentum of each body okay so this is how you write the law of conservation of momentum in the vertical direction now we have got two equations one for horizontal direction one for vertical direction now we are going to solve this we are going to see how to solve the situation with an example so i'm taking the same example but i'm giving the values both masses values initial velocities final velocities if you look at the question there are two unknown quantities we don't know v2 we don't know theta2 so always you can remember if there are two unknown quantities in a question you will need two equations one equation can find only one quantity so if there are two unknown you will need two equations that's how you can understand in a momentum question do you need to write the equation for horizontal and vertical direction or just one direction is enough if there are two unknown quantity you always need two equations so i'm going to make the two equations of conservation of momentum one for horizontal direction one for vertical direction for horizontal direction before already we have seen this equation i'm just substituting the values these are the values given you can see on the top of the page the values are given now i am solving this the only unknown thing in this equation is v2 cos theta 2 i can calculate all other parts except v2 cos theta 2 so i am calculating all the things which are possible to calculate and i am making the unknown thing that is v2 cos theta 2 as the subject finally you will get an equation v2 cos theta 2 equal to 4.22 so this is just one equation you have two unknown things v2 you don't know theta 2 you don't know so let's keep this equation there now for vertical direction before and after before as we have seen nothing is moving vertically so the momentum is zero and i'm going to substitute every value i am already putting a minus there because the vertical components are opposite to each other we have seen in the previous slide again the same method i'm making v2 sin theta to the unknown thing as the subject finally i will end up with an equation v2 sin theta 2 equal to 1.6 so we have now two equations one a cos equation another one a sin equation now i'm going to solve these two equations that's what you call simultaneous equations i am writing sine equation on the top because when i divide i can get tan theta sine theta by cos theta is tan theta i'm going to solve these two equations similar equations i'm just dividing one by one 
V2 and V2 will cancel. Sin theta by cos theta is tan theta. So you will get tan theta 2 answer. And from that you can find theta 2 by taking tan inverse. You will get 20.8 degrees. So one of the quantity we calculated. We found the answer for theta 2. Now the only unknown thing is V2. But it's easy, you can see there are two equations on the top, one with sine theta, one with cos theta. So you can substitute this theta value in any of the equation. I'm using sine, but you could use cos also. And now the only unknown thing is V2, and you can calculate V2. So we have found both unknown things, V2 and theta2. Remember, if there are two unknown things, you need two equations. But if there are only one unknown quantity, you can do it with one equation, just horizontal or vertical. There is an alternative method using vector diagram. The same example, but we did a big calculation. I'm going to solve it using a diagram. So same thing, same values, okay? But this time there's no splitting, no resolving vectors, just drawing a diagram. So both momentum before m1 u1 and m2 u2 are horizontal. You could directly add them. I am representing them as a single vector. The blue and red together, both bodies momentum I have represented by a single vector. The value of the vector will be 35. All the values are given m1 u1 m2 u2. So I am just adding the momentum I will get 35. So that's the total momentum before. Like that, after the body m1, momentum I know, because I know the mass, I know the velocity, and total momentum of m1 after collision is 16. Here, no need to split or anything, just directly draw the momentum in exactly same direction. Should not change the direction. But for m2, I don't know the momentum. So I'm just keeping like P2. I'm going to find that. Okay. Now we have three vectors and we are going to solve it. So you can just remember how you used to find the resultant vector in unit one. A graph. Okay. So I want to represent initial momentum 35, final momentum of one body 16, and I had to find the final momentum of the other body. So I'm going to draw everything to scale, but before drawing, you need to choose a very good scale. What scale you have to choose depends on how big graph you are given. For example, in this case, I'm choosing the scale as one centimeter in the diagram represents two units of momentum. Otherwise, the graph will be very, very small. So to make the diagram fit in the graph or look large enough, I have to choose a perfect scale. This is the scale I'm using. So first I want to draw the initial momentum. I have drawn the initial momentum. The value is 35, but according to my scale, it should be 17.5 centimeter, just half. Okay. Then I have to draw the momentum of the other body that is 16 but it's at an angle 30 degree so i'm using a protractor and measuring 30 degree and drawing a line this line should be 8 centimeter long because the momentum is 16 exactly half now you can see a gap when you fill the gap you will see you will get the other body's momentum Always when you draw the momentum of every body before and after collision, you should get a closed shape. That's what law of conservation of momentum says. There should not be any result and everything should be closed. So you drew the line, you connected the end and starting of the vectors, but we don't know the length. So use a ruler and measure the length. I'm getting the length as 11.3 centimeter but it's not 11.3 newton second i know because i am using a scale so what will be the momentum you just have to multiply by 2 so 22.6 is the 
momentum of the second body. But the question was to find the velocity, not momentum. I have to divide by mass, so I will get the velocity 4.5. Not finished. The question even asked to find the angle. The angle, the second body's momentum after collision makes with the horizontal line. So I am marking the angle here, theta, and again I am using a protractor to measure the angle. And the angle I got is 21. This is how you can solve two-dimensional collision questions using a graph. Now we are going to bring kinetic energy into the picture. You can see the diagram. A lot of atoms are moving around randomly. They collide with each other and also they collide with the walls of the container. You can just imagine the collision of air molecules around you. If you observe, what you can see is they are not settling down on the earth. They are never losing their energy. So such collisions where the kinetic energy is same before and after a collision. Such collisions we call elastic collisions. The collision between molecules you can consider a good example of an elastic collision. Total kinetic energy is conserved just like momentum we have seen before. If the kinetic energy is conserved it's called an elastic collision. Another example you can think about is a Newton's cradle. It's not a perfect example though. At the beginning the Newton's cradle collides elastically but after some time they lose energy and become what you call inelastic. Inelastic collisions. You can see the example there. Two cars are colliding and in the collision there will be a lot of heat produced, lot of sound produced, means they cannot maintain their kinetic energy. Such collisions where kinetic energy is lost or kinetic energy is converted to other forms, such collisions we call inelastic, kinetic energy not conserved. Okay. Now let's see the definitions of elastic and inelastic collision. Just now we have discussed. Elastic collision definition is collision in which K is conserved. If you want to prove any collision is elastic, what you can do is find the kinetic energy of the system before. System means all the body's kinetic energy before a collision. If it's equal to all the body's kinetic energy after collision, it's called elastic. If it's not equal, we call inelastic. But remember, momentum is always conserved. It doesn't matter whether it's elastic or inelastic. Momentum will be always, always conserved. Now let's see a special case of elastic collision. You can see a snooker board there. The white ball collides with the red one and after collision the white one stops and the red one moves off. Okay, so what you are asked to prove is this collision is elastic. If the first object stops and the second one moves, the collision will be always elastic. So how do you prove this collision is elastic? Okay, let's see the proof or the explanation for this. What you can understand first is momentum is always conserved. Whether it's elastic or inelastic, momentum is always conserved. The momentum lost by the first body should be equal to the momentum gained by the second one. So always you can use the equation m1v1 is equal to m2v2. m1v1 is the momentum of the white ball and m2v2 is the momentum of the red one. But in this case, the two balls should be exactly identical, so the masses are equal. If the masses are equal, according to this equation, the velocities should be equal. 
So if m1 is equal to m2, v1 should be equal to v2, then only the equation will be correct. So the second coin should have exactly the same velocity as the first one, which was moving before. Now we are going to use the equation for elastic. If it's elastic, always kinetic energy before is equal to kinetic energy after. In this special example, both masses m1 and m2 are equal and already you have proved v1 and v2 are also equal. Using the concept of momentum, you have proved it. So this equation is true here. So the collision is elastic because the kinetic energy is conserved. Now we are going to see an example where the conservation of momentum as well as the concept of kinetic energy is applied. This is a ballistic pendulum, which is a device used to measure the speed of very fast moving objects like a bullet. So you can see a bullet drawn there, the red color bullet. When it hits the block, what happens is the block will move upwards through a height. By measuring this height, you can calculate how fast the bullet was moving. So we are going to find the speed of the bullet and I'm again drawing the positions there. Block was initially vertical. Let's consider the mass of bullet is let's say 2 grams. Mass of block is 150 gram and the block rises to a height of 6 centimeter. We are going to find the initial speed u of the bullet. Let's say v was the speed of bullet and the block after collision. The bullet sticks to the block and moves up together. So let's say v is their common velocity after collision. So I am going to use the conservation of momentum. The initial momentum is only for the bullet because the block was not moving at the beginning. mu is the momentum of the bullet plus zero I am taking because the block was not moving. After collision, the block and the bullet are moving together. So I am adding both masses together into their common velocity v. But the problem here is I don't know their velocity after collision. I want to find u but I don't know v. If I could get v easily I can solve this. Now I am trying to find the velocity of the block and bullet after collision. So I am going to use another concept, another law that's law of conservation of energy. After the collision, what happens is the kinetic energy of the block and bullet is getting converted to the potential energy. That idea, law of conservation of energy, I am going to use. So I can write the half mv square of the bullet and block is equal to mgh of the bullet and block. But we don't have to care about the mass because the same mass appears on either side, so I just cancelled. Then I am rearranging the equation to get V. So when you take half the other side to become 2, it's cross multiplication. Now you want to remove the square. If you want to remove the square, you have to put a square root on the other side. This is our equation now. I know all the quantities. G is 9.81. The height is given, but it's in centimeters. I could convert it to meters like this. The answer I got is 1.08. That's the speed of the bullet and block after collision. That's our V. Now you can go back to the first equation and substitute the value of V there and you can get the initial speed of the bullet U. So the bullet was moving at 82 meter per second. Okay. I'm going to use the same example to check whether the collision was elastic or inelastic. Means whether the kinetic energy was conserved in the collision or not. I can use the values that we calculated before. So using the values I am going to check whether this collision is elastic or inelastic. I know the values of masses of block and bullet, the height I know, the speed, initial speed of the bullet just now we found. Then final speed of the bullet and the block together also calculated. So we know all these values. I'm going to check whether it's elastic or inelastic. 
So what I need is kinetic energy before and kinetic energy after. If they are equal, then it's elastic, otherwise inelastic. So let's find the kinetic energy before. Before only the bullet was moving, the kinetic energy of the block is zero. But after both bullet and block was moving together with a common velocity v. I'm substituting all the values, but we have already calculated the mass, we know the speeds, and I got 6.7 joules. That was the kinetic energy of the bullet before collision. Now, after collision, I'm substituting all the values and finding the kinetic energy. I got 0.082. It's, there's a big difference between the answers, means the bullet is losing a lot of its kinetic energy during the collision. As you know, practically there will be a lot of sound and heat developed. This is the reason why kinetic energy is not conserved. So the equation is not correct. So the collision is inelastic. Kinetic energy before is not equal to kinetic energy after. So the collision is inelastic. Now we are going to derive a relation between kinetic energy and momentum. We know both of them look very similar. One is mv, the other one is half mv square. Now we are going to connect them using a single equation. I am starting from the equation for momentum, p is equal to mv. Now on the right hand side, I want kinetic energy, which is half mv square. So in order to get half mv square, I am squaring both sides of the equation. If you do same operation on both sides, the equation is going to be still the same. But I want only half mv square, not m square v square. So I want to remove one mass. For that, what I'm doing is I'm dividing the entire equation by mass. So on the right hand side, what happens is there's m square on the top and m in the bottom, the denominator. So one of the mass will get cancelled and you get mv square. Still, we didn't get kinetic energy, it's half mv square. I want a half. So what I'm doing is multiplying by half on both sides. And the equation will be still the same. This is the equation for kinetic energy. Means kinetic energy is always equal to momentum square divided by two times mass or half into p square by m. This is the relation connecting kinetic energy and momentum. Now, if you want momentum as a subject, so I'm using the equation again, I want to get momentum on the left hand side as a subject, just p. I'm cross multiplying, I'm taking 2m on the other side. So it will become p square is equal to 2m into kinetic energy. Now I want to remove the square. If you want to remove the square, just put a square root on both sides or when you move the square to the other side, it becomes square root. This is the equation connecting momentum and kinetic energy with momentum as the subject. On the left hand side, what you see is the same equation with kinetic energy as the subject. Okay. Now we are going to see some calculations based on the equation just now we have seen the relation between kinetic energy and momentum. That's kinetic energy is equal to p square by 2m. So the question says if the momentum of a body is doubled, what will happen to the kinetic energy? Mass remains the same. So you are just making the momentum double and you are asked to find out what will happen to energy. This is the equation connecting kinetic energy and momentum. But in these type of questions, when all the values are not given, for example, here mass is not given. If every value is not given, you cannot use the entire equation. In such cases, you need to make a relation out of the equation. You can make a relation out of an equation by removing all the constants, constants in that particular question. For example, here mass, m is a constant, 2, 2 is just a number, it's always a constant. So I'm going to remove 2m and I will get the 
relation. So this is the relation between energy and momentum. E is directly proportional to P square. I have removed all the constants, so you get the relation. In these type of questions, when every de details or data is not given, you will have to form a relation out of an equation. Now let's see how to solve this question. What happens here is momentum is doubled. P is becoming twice. So according to the equation, energy is related with P square, not P. Whatever happens to P square, same change will happen to E also. That's what you call directly proportional. Directly proportional means whatever happens to the left hand side, same thing should happen to the right hand side also. For example here, momentum double we know, but the equation is for P square. So we are going to find out what will happen to P square because same thing should happen to energy also. So in order to know what will happen to P square, I am squaring everything in the relation. P square, 2 square, again P square. Everything is squared. I can remove the bracket and I will get 2 square is 4, 4 times P square. So the change in P square is the P square value increased by 4 times and the P square is directly proportional to energy. So whatever change happens to P square should happen for energy also. Here P square is increased 4 times so energy also should increase by 4 times. Okay. Now let's plot a graph for the equation energy and momentum energy is directly proportional to momentum square. So what will be the shape of such a graph? We are not plotting P square. If you plot P square, you will get a straight line passing through origin because they are directly proportional. We are plotting P. So it should not be a straight line. Let's see what kind of curve it's. It's a curve with increasing gradient because as you can see in the calculation for a small change in momentum, there's a big change in energy. When the momentum is just doubled, the energy is increased by four times. So if you check from the graph for a small change, I have taken two lines to represent the change in momentum. So for a small change in momentum, you can see there's a big change in energy. That's why the shape of the graph is like this. Okay. Now, another calculation but this time energy is doubled and they are asking what will happen to the momentum. So again I am using the same equation and as I told before when you remove the constants you get the relation. The relation between energy and momentum is E is proportional to P square. So whatever happens to the energy same change should happen to P square. Remember not P P square. Okay, so let's see here the energy is doubled. Now you know energy is directly proportional to P square. So whatever change happened to energy, same change should happen for P square. Means P square will also increase by two times. So P square is doubled, but the question doesn't ask for P square, the question asks what will happen to P, not P square. So we are going to find out from the given relation, we are going to find out what's going to happen for P. P square is doubled. So if you want to know what happened to P, you have to put square root everywhere or you have to remove the square which will become a square root. Now I'm again solving the equation. Square root of 2, let it be there. P square when you take the square root you get P. So the change in P is root 2 times. The new momentum will be root 2 multiplied by the old moment. Okay. The last topic of this slide a special case of elastic collision in two dimension. In this example I have taken again a snooker board you see the white ball and the red one. The white ball is going and colliding to the red one but this time 
not a head-on collision it's at an angle so you can see what happens it's colliding at an angle and after collision they move at different angles okay now let me tell why this is a special case this is a special case because if the balls have identical mass if the masses are equal and if they undergo an elastic collision you can see after collision they will be moving exactly perpendicular to each other the condition is both of them should have exactly same mass and they should collide elastically means there should not be any loss in kinetic energy if these two conditions are satisfied after collision the bodies will always move at an angle of 90 degree now we are going to prove this using a suitable calculation i'm going to prove this i'm going to represent the momenta of the balls before and after collision by vectors so let's say this is the momentum of the white ball before collision let's call it as p1 and after collision let's say this is the momentum of the red one let's call it p2 and this is the momentum of the white ball after collision let's call it p3 now what we are going to prove is the angle between p2 and p3 is 90 degree we are going to prove this but before that the conditions it's already said that the collision is elastic means the total kinetic energy before should be equal to total kinetic energy after i'm going to write the kinetic energy of each balls before and after so kinetic energy just now we have seen the equation is momentum square divided by two times mass this is the kinetic energy of white ball before collision that should be equal to kinetic energy of red one after collision plus kinetic energy of white ball after collision you can always write this equation if they say the collision is elastic okay so the first condition collision is elastic so you can directly write this equation now the second condition is both balls have same mass it's already given that both balls have the same mass so what i can do is just cancel the mass from all the terms so you got this equation p1 square is equal to p2 square plus p3 square this looks very similar to another equation do you remember which equation that's pythagoras theorem a square is equal to b square plus c square pythagoras theorem applies only for right triangles for this equation to apply for pythagoras theorem to apply always the angle between two vectors should be 90 degree so the pythagoras theorem holds only for 90 degree that's why the angle between p2 and p3 should be 90 degree okay thank you